As the sun rose on Sunday, August 12th, 1821, Dublin prepared for what promised to be one of the largest celebrations in the city in living memory. It had been over a century since a reigning British monarch had set foot on Irish soil, but King George IV was expected to arrive in the port of Dunleary later that afternoon. Throughout that Sunday morning, a constant stream of people could be seen leaving the city and making the seven-mile trek to the port where the Royal Flotilla was due to dock. For some, the pageantry and sense of occasion was motive enough, but for the more politically minded, they made the journey in anticipation that the King's arrival potentially heralded a new era in Irish history. George IV would be the first British monarch to visit Ireland without an army, and for some at least, this infused deep political symbolism in the event. They saw the potential that his arrival could begin a new, peaceful chapter in Anglo-Irish relations, which had been marred by invasion, conquest and violence. Certainly, nothing had been left to chance in the preparations. Months of careful planning had gone into every detail. The symbolism of each act had been carefully considered, For example, the king was not going to be met by the reception committee on the man-made stone pier at Dunleary, but instead they would let him set foot on actual Irish soil before they greeted him. This was then going to be followed by a royal procession along seven miles of roads that had been cleaned for the occasion between Dunleary and Dublin city centre. Pre-arranged assembly points for various groups, including those on horseback and in carriages, had been published in the press so they could fall in behind the king on the procession. Throughout the Sunday morning itself, thousands began to arrive in the port of Dunleary, while the waters of the harbour bristled with ships of the British Royal Navy, alongside smaller pleasure crafts and yachts of private individuals that were going to form a maritime escort. However, it proved to be a long wait. But finally, at 4pm in the afternoon, anticipation on shore finally began to rise, When the Navy ships received word the King was approaching Dublin Bay, weighed anchor and sailed out to greet him. The multitude on shore would have to wait another two hours before the spectacle truly began. But at 6pm, cannons fired a volley over Dunleary to announce the King's imminent arrival, before the royal yacht finally came into view. The long-anticipated moment had arrived, but there was no doubt what unfolded left the assembled crowd stunned. In their reporting, the Dublin Evening Herald struggled to explain what had happened in words. They said, It is not in the power of language to describe the mortification and disappointment of the multitude. George IV, despite the weeks of planning in advance, was not actually on board the royal yacht. He had in fact crossed in a different vessel, which had docked at the port of Hoth nearly 20 miles away to the north of Dublin earlier in the afternoon. However, all things considered, this may have been better for all concerned. In a move that didn't bode well for the rest of his visit, George had begun as he meant to continue. He stepped ashore in Hoth, dead drunk, after several hours drinking whiskey at sea. And so began the first British royal visit in modern Irish history. Hello and welcome to the Irish History Podcast. My name is Finn Dwyer and this is the first modern royal visit to Ireland. Today's episode is the second show in my mini-series of podcasts based on research for my upcoming book A Lethal Legacy, A History of Ireland in 18 Murders. These stories, for various reasons, never made the final edit of the book, but rather than let them gather dust, I wanted to share them with you in this series. Now this episode is called the first modern royal visit because it was very much a break with the past. There had been several other royal visits to Ireland, but given George IV's limitations on a personal and a political level, this was very much a break with the past. He brought no army, had little or no political impact, and the entire trip was surrounded by scandal, gaffes, pomp and ceremony, basically what we've come to expect from the royals. Some of this material was actually going to be the opening chapter of a lethal legacy, a history of Ireland and 18 murders, but that's ended up being pretty different now. The book itself will be out on September the 14th, so you can find out what I'm talking about then, but it'll be available in all formats 
hardback, ebook, and audiobook narrated by myself. Now, if you pre order a hard copy from Eason's.com today, you not only get 10% off when you use the coupon code FD10, but you'll also get the book shipped to you in advance before it hits the shops. So if you're in Ireland anyway, you'll get the book delivered to your door on the day it's released. You can find links to Eason's and that code FD10 in the show notes below. I think I mentioned it last week as well, but the launch is taking place in Dublin on September the 14th as well. If you're around Dublin on that day, it would be great to see you there. It's on in Hodges Fligus on Dawson Street at 6pm. That's just up from Trinity College. As I say, it would be wonderful to see you there. In terms of this episode, I want to flag one article I used in particular. That's Karina Holton's All Our Joys Will Be Completed, The Visit of George IV to Ireland. It was really excellent. It was published in the journal Irish Historical Studies, and although it is behind a paywall, any public library in Ireland provides you with access through JSTOR, the electronic archive. If you go into any library, as I say, they'll be able to tell you how you can get access to it. Now, sound on the episode is by Kate Dunley. The decision of George IV to undertake a visit to Ireland in the summer of 1821 was, in a word, bizarre. But so much about the monarch's life could be described as such. The timing of the visit, though, was strange, to say the least. George had only recently ascended to the throne, and things for the king were not going well. But he had no one to blame but himself. It wasn't that he was finding being king hard. He had, in truth, been the effective king for over a decade since his father, George III, had been deemed insane. The truth was, though, he was just bad at it. Although George IV was already in his 40s, by the 1820s, he had displayed a remarkable unsuitability for the role of monarch. Since he had taken over his father's duties back in 1811, he had inevitably come under increased public scrutiny And what the public had seen then and since, they had not liked. George loved the high life. He ran up enormous deaths, had an endless stream of mistresses and was a hard drinker. In these pursuits, as I say, he ran up huge debts that would be equivalent of millions of pounds today. And all that had to be paid by public monies. While this was never going to endear him to his subjects, the fact that he was particularly out of step with events and conditions at the time only made it worse. Because you see, while George was living it up, Britain was at war with France and then even when peace was established in 1815, a deep recession followed. So a lot of people were hurting while he was spending public money left, right and centre. Now while this profligacy made him very unlikable, he also had an amazing ability to rile people up. An example of this was his reaction to the Peterloo Massacre of 1819 which had seen magistrates in Manchester respond to a peaceful demonstration by sending in troops who killed several people. While this caused outrage, George sent the magistrates a message of congratulations. Meanwhile, his domestic life made him even more unpopular. In 1795, he had married his first cousin, a German princess, Caroline of Brunswick, but his treatment of the woman only reinforced the notion that he was a reprehensible character. He was so drunk at their marriage that he had to be helped stand upright. And then he continued drinking throughout the day, so much so that he collapsed when he entered the wedding bedroom. The honeymoon confirmed to Caroline that the marriage was not going to be a pleasant experience because George brought his then mistress, Frances Villiers, Lady Jersey, with him. Although George and Caroline would conceive a child, a daughter named Charlotte, their marriage was a total disaster. George despised his wife and treated her appallingly, but this only provoked public sympathy for Caroline and increased antipathy towards George. Even though she would leave England for Europe, beginning a prolonged tour around 1814, George continued to punish his wife, which only made him more unpopular. In late 1820, he tried to divorce Caroline in a bid to prevent her becoming queen as he was about to be crowned king. Now this saw evidence gathered in Milan that claimed she had had an affair. This was presented to the House of Lords and began what was, in effect, a public trial of Caroline. It spoke volumes to George's popularity that in an age of rampant misogyny, that even though evidence confirming Caroline's infidelity was produced, it failed to shift the dial 
She remained popular and George IV was intensely disliked. Now, during these years, there's no question he knew he was disliked. The public made their views known on multiple occasions. He was frequently taunted and jeered and on occasion his carriage was even pelted by crowds. I bring this up as a context though to his visit to Ireland because given he was beset by problems on numerous fronts in England, his announcement that he intended to visit Ireland in the summer of 1821 surprised many. From the perspective of the monarch it was odd, there was no pressure or expectation on him to do this. As I mentioned earlier, no king had set foot in Ireland since the 1690s. Furthermore, Ireland was potentially a political powder keg and a visit was likely only to pile further pressure on the king. Discontent in Ireland had been bubbling away beneath the surface for decades and sometimes even above the surface. In 1798, the island had seen the largest popular uprising in modern history, which was put down with a ferocity that shocked many. This was then followed by the Acts of Union under which Ireland was brought into the United Kingdom. Although most in Ireland opposed this move, the British government had assuaged some opposition by suggesting they would remove the legal discriminations against Catholics which were in place at the time. Now it's worth bearing in mind Catholics were about 80% of the population. Advocates of the union with Britain also claimed it would be beneficial to Ireland. Now if we fast forward 21 years to when George is coming, to Ireland, it was clear that the United Kingdom between Britain and Ireland had been a disaster, for Ireland at least anyway. The Irish economy had plunged into a deep recession, while Catholic emancipation, that's the removal of legal discriminations against Catholics, was yet another broken promise. This therefore created a political minefield for George IV, a man who had displayed he was without tact at the best of times. Some in Britain even feared the visit could be a disaster. Alongside the myriad of potential problems in Ireland, there was also sympathy for Queen Caroline and there had been demonstrations in her favour in Dublin as recently as late 1820. George, however, ignored all advice, pressed ahead and announced that he was going to Ireland in 1821. His reasons were never entirely clear, but they appeared to have been rooted in a long-held personal desire to visit the island. And although his formal coronation ceremony had only taken place in July 1821, he almost immediately set off for the port of Holyhead after this from where he would depart to Ireland. Now along the route to Holyhead, news that had the potential to turn the visit against George arrived when it emerged that Queen Caroline, who he had failed to divorce the previous year, had died. Now George himself was probably pretty delighted by this news. Earlier in the year, I think it might have been the previous year, When he had been told about the death of Napoleon Bonaparte by a courtier who said, Sir, your enemy is dead, he had responded with a quip saying, Is she dead by God? in reference to Queen Caroline. Now when she did actually die in 1821, while he was en route to Ireland though, he had to play this carefully. Her death had the potential to whip up animosity towards the king, given he had treated her so badly. Therefore, he was persuaded to delay his trip a few days and at least publicly mourn her passing. He did this and then eventually crossed over to Ireland in early August 1821, landing at Holt, not where the reception at Dunleary was waiting for him. Setting the tone for the trip though, as I mentioned, he was dead drunk when he arrived and was described by one person as being in the last vestiges of intoxication. He had spent the voyage eating goose pie and drinking whiskey, according to contemporary accounts. After managing to bow to a crowd that had gathered in Hoth, he then headed off to the Phoenix Park, where he would reside during his visit. Now, given the death of Queen Caroline required sensitivity, the king continued to demonstrate grief, and this saw him delay his royal entry into Dublin, an event that was going to see him paraded before the public. But this was delayed a few days. However, on the following Friday, It was deemed enough time had passed and the public aspect of his visit to Ireland began with this formal entry into Dublin. This took the form of a long, circuitous parade along the North Circular Road in the city. While some had harboured misgivings about how he was going to be received in Ireland, there was no question Dubliners came out in considerable numbers to welcome him and watch the immense public spectacle. Led by the king in an open carriage drawn by eight horses, he was followed by leading Irish nobles, cohorts from the military, the clergy, 
and representatives of Dublin's merchant and artisan class. Then, in a demonstration of subservience that harked back to earlier times, he was formally greeted by the Lord Mayor of the city, who knelt before him and gave him the symbolic keys to Dublin. Meanwhile, businesses in the city had also spent considerable amounts of money on what were called illuminations. These would have seen royal images projected by lamps and stencils onto windows. For those who feared that he might be jeered, they could begin to rest easy at this point, because over the following week of events, he was feted at every turn where he appeared in public. He conducted military reviews and was hosted at several receptions by the elite of the city. Dublin's public had, it seems, temporarily forgotten at least about Catholic emancipation and the late Queen Caroline. The following weekend, George would leave Dublin and he headed north for Slane Castle. Now today, it's a renowned concert venue. But in 1821, the attraction was the Lady of the House, who was the latest of George IV's mistresses, Lady Conningham. After spending the weekend there, he returned to Dublin, where he visited Trinity College, then the Linen Hall, a vast complex at the top of Church Street and the centre of the city's linen industry. He also left Dublin on a couple of other occasions. He visited the beauty spot of Powers Court in Wicklow and the famous Curragh racetrack. Now, there's little doubt that large numbers of Dubliners turned out to see the king whenever he appeared in public. For George himself, this made the visit to Ireland A spectacular success, certainly by his standards anyway. In her article on the visit, Karina Holton points out that this was somewhat unusual for George because he was pretty used to being jeered in public by this point in England. In terms of analysing though what this meant in terms of Irish public opinion, that's a little trickier. Biographers of George IV have claimed it illustrated widespread support for the king and that he was popular And certainly, his critics in England at the time condemned what they saw as the widespread demonstrations of support for George in Ireland. However, I think this is a somewhat simplistic understanding of Irish society at the time. That a British monarch, the first to visit Ireland since the 1690s, would draw considerable crowds in the 1820s shouldn't be that surprising. A considerable minority, at least, of the Irish population supported the union with Britain and were loyal subjects of the crown. And this was an opportunity for them to demonstrate their political views. Judging on reports from the time as well, it was probably a lot of fun. There was a carnivalesque atmosphere to these events. For these people as well though, George may not have been an ideal king, but he was the only one who had bothered to visit Ireland since the 17th century. And for all they knew in 1821, it might be another 130 years before another monarch would visit. It's also important to note that the crowds who did appear were self-selecting. We don't know the extent of opposition to his visit because obviously those people weren't going to turn up to welcome him. Furthermore, his visit was like all modern royal visits in that it was carefully choreographed and to assume that the events surrounding the visit reflected wider opinion may be a step too far. Perhaps a clear example of this was when his niece Victoria visited. She came to Ireland several times but the first occasion was in 1849 and the reception she received certainly did not reflect the situation or mood of many in the country. Victoria was largely welcomed, but Ireland was ravaged by the famine, and they had carefully chosen a route for Victoria that avoided places particularly badly affected by the Great Hunger. So it certainly distorted attitudes in the country at the time, and this may have been somewhat similar when George visited The article I've referenced throughout the show, that one by Karina Holton, also highlights some privately expressed opposition she has come across in her research. For example, Emily Butler, the Countess of Glengall, wrote scathingly of the visit in a letter when she said, The public presses teemed with disgusting balderdash and slavish blarney. His visit is making people spend money which they don't possess. Now, King George IV would depart Ireland on September the 3rd, this time as expected from Dunleary. But before he left, he made it clear that his visit had no deep political meaning and certainly demonstrated his ability to alienate people. At the dockside, before he boarded the ship to take him back to England, he snubbed the Catholic leader in Ireland, Daniel O'Connell, in a move that was intended to show disdain and his personal opposition for Catholic emancipation. Indeed, George would become one of the major obstacles to the passage of emancipation in 1829, 
and in the end he had to be forced to provide his assent by Parliament. George IV died in 1830 without an heir, so he was briefly succeeded by his brother William IV, who also died without an immediate heir in 1837. This cleared the way for their niece, Victoria, to take the throne. She would visit Ireland on multiple occasions. Now, while George IV was, without question, one of the most unpopular monarchs in modern times, and his visit was marked by his own buffoonish traits, the theatrics and media hype that surrounded it certainly reflected how similar subsequent royal visits would play out. In terms of more meaningful politics, George IV's visit had no discernible impact. In her assessment, the historian Karina Holton, who I've quoted a few times, summarised it as follows. A visit made on a whim, together with vested interests and carefully managed propaganda, combined to produce mismatched expectations of what the visit would achieve. While the Dublin administration viewed it as a success, there was, in fact, little positive outcome. This was certainly the case. Indeed, within weeks, Irish society would be focused on other matters. George IV's visit had been overshadowed by appalling weather and near-endless rain. This continued through autumn, which had a devastating impact on the harvest of that year. Now, failing crops and rising food prices would lead to a murder that shocked Ireland. And this is the first one covered in my book, A Lethal Legacy, A History of Ireland and 18 Murders. As I mentioned earlier, you can pre-order your copy today at easons.com. And if you use the coupon code FD10, you get a 10% discount. I have links to that in the show notes below. Now, I'll be back next week with another story based on research that didn't make the final edit of A Lethal Legacy. Until then, Sloan. Sloan.